Yes, and hopefully Bill's working on a version for when you play cards, you know, to help with your dealing. Um, water is, of course, one of the great joys of life. It quenches our thirst, it powers our body, it cleans us, we swim in it, we put frozen cubes of it in a nice gin and tonic at the end of a hard day. But there is one place you never want to find even a drop of water, and that is in a diesel engine. I've worked on diesel fuel systems since I was 17. Whether it be agricultural, vehicles on the road, I've travelled the world repairing these components. In time, I've discovered that the most common problem with diesel engine is getting water in your fuel. And this can happen in the outback, or it can happen when you're filling up at your local suburban service station. Water corrodes everything. It'll stop your car stone dead. Any big diesel workshop can see one a week. And you may find that you have to replace the whole fuel system to rectify the problem. Diesel engines are even more susceptible today because we're using common rail technology, which is more precise, less tolerant, and more susceptible to damage through water. In Australia, this will cost you a lot of money. But as a friend pointed out, in developing countries, aid organisations and communities rely on these diesel generators to produce clean water, electricity, and run their hospitals. And if they would lose one of these generators, it could cost lives. So, how do you keep the water out? An umbrella for diesel engines? Please welcome David Webster. G'day, David. So, I remember working in a mine at Weeper where we had this problem of water in the tank. Tell me what you've done to solve the problem. Well, in this case here, we've fitted the water watch to this, this vehicle. This thing here, yep. Yep. And um, that's to protect it from the ingress of water. So it's fitted before the main factory filter. So, so you've got it here between the tank and the, and the filter That's that came correct, with the car. Yeah. Excellent. Now, how long does it take to install this device? Under two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you get a me mechanic to do that? Yeah. We've assembled a kit that has uh, all the instructions and all the components. So right. most people can do it. So it's a bit hard to see it in here. Let's, let's go and actually see what the actual, your invention, the water watch, looks like. So here's, here it is outside um, of, of the car. Tell me, what are the different parts that you can see here? Uh, we have a sensor here, mm -hmm. solid state sensor. Uh, this is an adapter which sets our level because we need a level at which this will go off. Yep. And this assembly here is non-restrictive so that this doesn't affect the vehicle's fuel system flow. So David, this is the sensor here and mm -hmm. you can see this. So this is effectively the same thing that's inside that's correct, yes. and, and, and the little tip at the end is what's actually measuring the, the water in the fuel. That's right, yes. how, how does it detect the water? Uh, with uh, measuring resistance. So it's electrical conductivity. conductivity. Yes. Great. So let's give it a go. So, so this beaker, this is... Turn it on. Yeah, great. When we turn it on, it goes through a pre-check system. So that's all good? Yep. Great. <laughs> uh, so here we have 100% diesel. Mm. So we put it in. Surprisingly enough, nothing happens, which is probably, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. But the moment I put it into here, which is just plain water. Great, so that's telling us. But the real test is what happens when we put some of the water into diesel. Okay, so we've got the water in the diesel. There we go. So what that, that's just told us yeah, there's water's present in the fuel. Well, diesel technology is really growing. Like, I think they're expecting half the cars in Europe to be diesel. Mm. Is the idea that this would be integrated into new cars? It'd be good, though, eh? Um, maybe as an aftermarket product, even this one in particular is made for the little European cars. Yeah, This fantastic. particular model, yeah. Yeah, so you're going for the big bucks. That's great. Um, is, but this model here is retrofittable, is that right? That's right, you can fit any one of them to any vehicle because it has no restriction to flow across the top of the yeah. big unit. Does this have any maintenance requirements in itself? Like, does it have to be calibrated every now and then to make sure it's still working? Not really, the system checks itself every time it starts, of course. But um, all you might have to do is drain the bowl out if you gather sediment. You've obviously been fairly active in the IP front. I see you filed a few patent application design registrations. I mean, what's the overall IP strategy? How are you going about protecting this? This section here is very unique, the glass bowl, so we protected it as uh, individual items. Obviously the big threat for technology like this 
is that your manufacturers are going to incorporate this into the vehicles at the time of manufacture, thus eliminating the retrofit market. Is your IP strategy aiming to prevent that from happening, to give you something to go after the manufacturers with or license or...? To a point, yeah. It's a difficult area, as you well know. <laughs> um, but we've tried our best to do each piece as an individual so that you can't... They're not trying to pattern the idea it's a known technology, it's how we've used it. What about cost? I mean, what does it cost to get one of these or in, then have it installed? This unit uh, is uh, just under $500. Okay. Yeah. Well, David, it's a real boon, particularly when you can't guarantee the quality of the fuel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now it's time for our judges to pick a winner who will get this. Is it Richard Haynes and Alex Bruce and their eTool, Bill Isom and his pro ball trainer, or David Webster's water watch? Let's firstly get a comment from you, Matt, about what you see as the uh, pluses and minuses of each inventor's IP strategy. What do you reckon? Well, looking at it, we've got three very different IP challenges. On one hand, with the eTool, we've got an invention that they don't really want to protect in terms of litigating or stopping other people from using the technology. But at the same time, if there's a lot of players in the market, it's just not going to work. Mm. As far as the Pro Ball trainer goes, look, at first glimpse it doesn't look particularly new, but at the same time, look, there's, some, there's obviously some special source in mm. the way this latex is working. But for them, look, patents might work, but really, if they're going to get this out there and really get the market share, they're going to have to worry about things like branding and really just getting the distribution channels right to get that in front of as many people as they can. Yep. And then you move on to something like the water watch, something much more conventional from a device point of view. We've got a, we've got a gadget here they want to protect, but at the same time, for longevity of commercial success, the gadget really isn't the key. The key is going to be stopping the auto manufacturers from integrated in, into their products to begin with. I think that's why, you know, I think that whole strategy of just selling the IP to them straight up, I think is the best way to go because, I mean, in ideal, it would be that this is integrated into new cars and consumers don't really have to think about it. And what's, it, what's interesting is you can see how IP influences all the criteria we normally look at. Um, for, the, for the water watch, it's about originality. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the Pro Ball trainer, it's about marketability because, you know, it's such an improvement around What's, what's currently there or what I remember. Yeah. And in terms of the e-tool, it's about actually design and, 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 and getting that design um, out there and making it making the dominant it design. Making it accessible. And I think yep. that's the key with that one. I mean, the very fact that they've come on the show here means that it's not patentable anymore um, because yeah. you've broken the golden rule. You've broken patents. the golden rule and published, but it's still a case of you need to find some way to capture that market share and hold on to it. For me, the interesting space is to think about need. Um, I think there's a, there's a very clear need uh, for example, for the e-tool, um, it's so much cheaper to make changes during the design phase. What I really like about it as well is that it's actually packaged for a whole range of different uh, customers, if you like. So it is for the architect, it is for the homeowner as well, um, and it is for the environmental consultant as well. They can also use it. And you can see, like, down the track, what you're going to see is people using this tool to market their own products. They're going to latch onto designs people have submitted through the e-tool and say, well, if you use our product, you're going to increase your environmental efficiency by this much. Come speak to us. From a need point of view, you know, like at first I sort of thought, oh yeah, well, people in their luxury cars, oh boo hoo, you know, you break down. But um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> there's the girl from no, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but actually, you know, when you think about the developing world and how much they're relying on biodiesels, how unrefined those biodiesels are, the fact that they're in humid areas too, so you're going to get more content, uh, condensation, more chance of water in there. I mean, the fact that it's going to make those generators more reliable, uh, that's really up there for me. Now, now, marketability is also interesting because, you know, the, the market for the Pro Ball is potentially every single household, you know, in Australia, if not the world. Um, how, how would you protect that market? How would you actually go how about it? Look, with something like that, it's going to come down to your branding. It's going to, it's going to be the case of you want that to be the product that everybody wants to put under their Christmas tree this year. All right, then. Well, who is your winner and why, Matt? Well, for me, I'm going to have to go with, go with the Water Watch just on the basis that it has the marketability, there is a need for it, and it looks like the IP is fairly secure in that space. Mm, okay. Either of you disagree? James? Look, James, for the reasons of, of both originality and, and, I, and I really like the engineering design as well, I'm going to go with the water watch. Water watch is I too found the water watch most compelling. Compelling. All right, the winner is David Webster's <laughs> water watch. Well done, David. Yeah. Congratulations. David's in the running to be named our inventor of the year. Thanks to our judges, especially guest judge Matt Ward. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Thanks to the stars of the show, the inventors. And see you next week. Good night. Well done, buddy. Before we go, some news on the liquid solar array that was on the show in 2009. Inventor Phil Connors has spent $50,000 on patents here and overseas, and he's now done a deal with India's largest private power generator. They're about to install units in a dam near Mumbai. It's useful in India because the high population density makes it hard to find space on land on which to place solar generators.